Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm really interested in finding out what happens with this book. <laughs> well, height dies. We know that, and I'm already dead. So it's it's not a good day for WRNR hosts and co-hosts. So if I could stay out of the book, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> so can we work Senator Rucker into the next book? Um, perhaps into the next book. Well, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. I'm not introducing any new characters into this one in the last five days. <laughs> Wait a second, new book. All right, uh, Senator Rucker, let's uh, let's get to it if we if we could here as well. You, uh, uh, as of late, had been updating us on the Route 340 closings and the uh, detours and reroutes. What kind of feedback are you getting on that? And as have you traveled it yourself to this point? And what is uh, what is your thought? Okay. I'll begin at the beginning. <laughs> yes, I've been getting updates. Um, you know, fortunately, the West Virginia Department of Highways has done a fairly good job of responding to the almost daily um, requests uh, for either information or tweaks or changes. Um, I or other legislators or commuters themselves have been contacting DOH directly and letting them know when the traffic light at 671 needs to be tweaked when there's a tree falling down, when there's a car disabled, just about anything you can imagine. And since all along that Route 9 to Virginia, back into West Virginia, any little thing just affects that traffic. I mean, it, it could just be a car that's pulled over or, you know, as you can imagine, um, the potholes repair, painting of the line that VDOT decided to do for some reason in October and mm -hmm. was just causing all sorts of consternation. But I'm happy to say they've been very responsive. And the latest update is that things are still progressing. Um, there's still no change in the estimated time, but it is painstaking work. Um, the second in command at DOH described it as... Um, surgery because it's like literally some rocks that are loose that have to be taken out and you have to be extremely careful and cautious boulders as big as cars and just having to get those rocks out moved removed and and just continuing that type of work um, so it is definitely painstaking work there are almost daily updates on the website and i just want to urge people to continue to go to that route 340 um website that has all the latest information pictures and uh, and you know any kind of um updates that need to be had i assume they have to bring in several pieces of heavy equipment does that mean they're going to need to, re need to relay the road on 340 during, during uh, in that section they have not said that, but I, I'm assuming, again, that they'll do whatever needs to be done um, within that up amount of time. I know that recently the Department of Highways has been painting lines all over Jefferson County, and I'm sure in their mind's eye they're like just trying to get everything else out of the way so that they can focus on that project. They had talked about 90 days, and we'd also heard 100 days. Do we know what the correct number is in terms of how long that road will be shut down? Their plan for what they determined with the construction company was 90 days. If it goes beyond that time, which is essentially December 12th, um, then, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, the construction um, company gets less or penalized. All right. I also want to answer your second question. Yes, yes I have driven it um, a couple times already. And fortunately, I haven't had any extreme delays myself when I've taken it. But I do carefully watch every single day for those updates and post on social media and also check out my GPS and Waze app. Very good. Now, uh, I want to make it clear, Senator Rucker, you can ask her any questions you want. It doesn't have to be about 340 or whatever, just uh, so you, you guys all understand. And anybody on Facebook who has a question they want to put there, if we have time, we'll get to those, too. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> the, the nightmare of the early days of this um, project where Shepherdstown was chock-a-block with, with, I presume, it was, it was not coincidental traffic. I assume it was somehow tied with the, the rerouting of 340. Have there been reports? Have people been pretty cool about this? Or are we getting to the road rage and 
at a stage of things where people were just really angry? Um, I am happy to report that things seem to have cooled down. Definitely there was um, the first two weeks a lot of anger um, <laughs> being expressed and also demonstrated. But things, I think, are cooling down. Part of it is that um, the OH has been responsive. Constituents have gotten heard. When they've reached out to me, I've responded to them that same day. And I think folks just need, need to know that we really, truly care about the huge inconvenience that this is on all of us. And um, and yes, I do believe that this detour is, of course, affecting Shepherdstown and affecting southern Jefferson County. Also, folks want choosing to go Route 7. So it is definitely affecting basically all the routes across the river. Yeah, a lot of teachers who live in West Virginia but teach at Brunswick High School in uh, Washington, or Frederick County, right across uh, the bridge there. And I know that affects them as well. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, I think of the uh, the detour through Hillsborough. Is it when when Route Nine was closed for a year, year and a half, whatever? And the the irony of it is the thirty mile detour to take you to a place that would be half a mile away right. if if they hadn't closed the roads. So it's uh, I, I, I'm confident that the the payoff will be worth the the price. And the good news is it's only three months, and we're a month into it, right? It's already we're a third of we the way are. through the project. I, uh, I think uh, tomorrow marks one month. I think wasn't it October 11, or September 11, yeah. or September 12, Senator Bucker? Yes, that is correct. So yes, we we've, we've just about at our one month mark, and I can tell you it can't end fast enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure. It is, I, I definitely worth doing. Um, again, I, I've mentioned this before. I, I've had that happen to me where I've had rocks that have um, basically caused a tire to burst at an area of the road, 340 and Chestnut Hill, where there really isn't any place to be off the road. Um, there's no real side you know, road you can get to while mm -hmm. you're waiting for a tow truck. I mean, it is really important that we get this fixed. Matt Miller. Oh, sorry, John. Did you have a follow-up? Did you have something? No, just, when it's all over, um, is it's such a beautiful drive down along the river there. When it's all over, um, is that going to be the like chain link uh, holding up the rocks? That is it going to change the the nature, the beauty of the drive when it's all done? I understand that safety trumps beauty, but right. I I I hope not. I mean, yes, obviously, chain link is going to be holding back the cliff and any potential loose loosening of rocks which is going to happen like that's just you're not going to stop that it's nature um but the, the chain will hold the rocks back so that they fall down to the ground straight um against the cliff and not on the roadway which is our goal having said that the beauty really is across the river you know looking towards harper's ferry and looking towards the bridges so that scenery is going to remain unchanged. Senator Rucker, you mentioned that there, there was not a real good place to pull off on that area of the road when you have had an incident of, of running over a rock and it, it busting a tire. Will any of this change allow for that road to be widened in any way or for a shoulder to be added or is this simply dealing with the cliff itself? So it's just dealing with the cliff and this is one of the areas in which I've been disappointed because uh, to me, it would have made sense to widen the road and to add a little bit more space, but that is not what was um, requested and conceived of. And the Department of Highways, um, you know, explained to me that this is a federal project with federal dollars. So there were, you know, certain things that they could get done within the concept of this project, but they couldn't go beyond that. Um, in the future, of course, the West Virginia Department of Highways and uh, us, your legislators, can try to see if we can get um, something done on the West Virginia side. And I myself was extremely disappointed to know that um, they told me that 340 itself is not going to be taken care of with this project. I mean, sorry, Chestnut Hill Road, sorry. Chestnut Hill Road itself is not being taken care of with this project, only 340. Well, I, as your unofficial political consultant, I advise that we not do more road construction for like another six months or so after this is done. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Fair request. 
No, the timing works though, right? Because it'll be the winter months, yeah. so it's hard to do that during the the winter. So you you might get that wish. It'll be at least six months. How did this kind of come about, uh, Senator Rucker? Was there a study done? Were there enough small bits of rock in the road uh, to to say, hey, we need to investigate this, and and then it's led to the work that's being done? Yes, exactly that. So I know that for years. Before I ever got into the legislature, Senator Unger was advocating for something to be done um, from the many complaints that he received. I could tell you my incidences with rocks started since I've moved to the area in 2000. Um, so it, it's been something that just keeps happening. And many, many, many reports to the police. There's rocks on the road. There's a, you know accident because of the rocks. So... A certain number of those trigger DOH to look into it and investigate, but I think it really became um, something they took on based on the advocacy that I and a few others have had in the most recent years, like seven years ago. I started just really um, insisting we do something. It, it's too much. As you guys know, there was a very serious incident. Um, that one wasn't with a rock, but with a tree that found someone. And, and killed them, and then, you know, just, like, we just can't keep having these, um, you know, horrible accidents that we knew would end up with more fatalities, not to mention the fact that we know how important this road is. We can see right now how important <laughs> that road is for our Jefferson County, for Harper's Ferry, um, and for all of the people who work. So it is just something that needed to be taken care of. And it, it happens to be the road that is furthest away from the Department of Highways headquarters in Charleston, That's true. West Virginia. Wow. So this is their you know, project with the most distance, but it is still important to us here. So does this now lead to a thought of a secondary road? In other words, you're talking about how important this road is, and we all in the Eastern Panhandle understand that. And now that everyone sees the alternate routes and how they're bottlenecked and smaller roads and far more miles, is this kind of a call? I mean, I know it takes forever to build a road anymore, but is Where this, would you put it? That's the thing. Is this a call, though, to figure out some alternate route? You know, I think that that would be extremely good. Um, common sense to do, to think, to have a discussion, have public hearings. I know that when we had uh, Jefferson County Commissioner Peter Onosco, who was only there for a short period of time, he was proposing, you know, some sites um, that could potentially be put a connecting road between us and Maryland. Of course, it's going to be something that takes a lot of money, takes a lot of planning, um, and there's always going to be opposition. So, we understand the need, but the folks whose property is going to be affected by anything, any project like that is always, you have to overcome all the different concerns and issues. But I certainly believe that it is important. I mean, we are talking about thousands of people, and these bottlenecks are a serious safety concern in, you know, matters of an emergency. So um, definitely would love to have that discussion. Senator Patricia Rucker, our guest here on the program, formerly education chair, now uh, also uh, chair of charter schools and such, of, of which there is an issue in Jefferson County, we understand, Senator Rucker, and some decisions will have to be made on how to fund uh, uh, one school in particular, which is in the red. What do you know about this situation, and what do you think some of the solutions might be? Yes, I have um, been kept abreast of those issues, and yes, so one of the issues with charter schools is um, they are getting more equitable funding. Up to 99% of the school aid formula travels with the student if they choose a charter school. But there's no money for facilities um, like our current public schools, which are paid with taxpayer dollars. For charter schools, they have to figure it out, um, how to get a location and a facility and whether they rent or whether they buy, they have to retrofit it and change the building to make it appropriate and safe for students, and that costs money. So obviously, for the new charter schools that have opened up, that money is something that, you know, had to be paid by someone. And that particular school, a management company, put the money forward for 
what they needed for the facilities and to get the, the school off the ground. But the charter school organization and the board is going to have to work together to find a way to pay them back for that. So most charter schools have this same scenario. It's definitely not unique or different. Um, in some states, they do a separate fund to help charter schools with the facilities costs, um, but we did not do that in West Virginia. So we shall see what, what needs to be done. Obviously, you know, it's a debt that needs to be paid. I, I don't feel like it's, it's an unsurmountable thing. I think we can figure this out. And there is fortunately plenty of folks involved with uh, common sense and eagerness to make this work that I think it's going to be resolved. Just as a program note, on Thursday at 835, we'll have James Paul. He is the Charter Schools Executive Director of the West Virginia uh, Professional Charter School Board. And he'll be on the program uh, during that half-hour segment there. We'll get more information on that. Do, do they have a meeting coming up this week, Patricia, or they, have they already had it? The EPPA Charter School yes. is going to have their next born meeting tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, okay. So uh, I, I knew the meeting, the interview with him was timely, but I wasn't sure if it was directly thereafter or not. So we'll get new information on Thursday about that. Go ahead, Matt. Can or do charter schools charge any kind of student fees or like a private school might? Or charter schools, we, we heard in the arguments leading into charter schools, they're still public schools. So does that mean they cannot charge any of those fees? In other words, would that be a way to help offset any of those other costs? They can only charge fees the same as other public schools can so if public schools and some do this charge a fee for you to participate in the marching band a charter school could do the same type of fee but it, it has to be the same as a public school so no they can't really charge parents a fee to pay for the facilities for example but what they can do is they can fundraise and there are um, organizations around the country that do donate money for charter schools there's also federal funds that are available that like are you apply for it like a grant and you can get some money for charter schools that way and i believe that that's one of the duties of the professional charter school board to do that to be applying for any grants that west virginia charter schools could be eligible for so i know that the folks at eppa who love their school do have done some fundraisers for specific things and specific needs and um and i'm i'm sure that that's also you know, part of the plan overall for helping the school succeed. What does EPPA stand for? Oh, I'm sorry. Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy. Thank you. Can an existing no private school carve out a part of of its student body to be charter school? A private school? Yeah. So if we already have a facility and there's part of a private school that's that, that charges tuition for the kids, can they then take in... Uh, what would be public school kids into their school and call it a charter school admission? So, I mean, I'm not certain how that would work, but it is legal for a charter school to lease space from an existing school, public or private. So, for example, if there's a school that has space they're not using and a charter school would like to use it, they could you know, lease that space and run their charter school. That's um, some of the magnet schools that you guys know about or hear about in Maryland. That's how they function. They're essentially a charter school that operates as part of a public school. And even though they're within a public, a regular public school, there's a magnet school component within that school. And they just, um, you know, kind of live in the same campus. So that, that is a possibility with a private school, but I can tell you, um, I haven't heard of that happening, um, not that I can think of. Senator Rucker, I was I thought of you recently when I heard that uh, President Biden was going to be getting a little tougher on the border and clamp down in terms of deportations. And what I heard was that they were starting with Venezuelans. Did you hear this and, and did you have any reaction to it when you heard it? I did hear it, and um, I was actually, you know, grateful and applauding that, you know, he had announced first that he was going to 
you know, fast track the asylum request of Venezuelans who clearly have escaped a very terrible situation in their country and have sought refuge here in the United States. And then almost two weeks later, it's the reverse, and they're actually fast-tracking, deporting them, um, which is very disappointing. I, I don't know what to tell you. I have never been in favor of, you know, what one calls amnesty, of just opening the doors and letting everyone in. I do believe we have a right to secure our borders and to know who's in our country. Um, I came in to the front door and did the application process and waited my time. I don't, I don't want to see that change. Having said that, asylum seekers, folks who literally come here claiming asylum, they have to prove that they are in risk of their lives um, back in their home country. And it would seem to me, like, why would you prioritize deporting those asylum seekers? Um, these are not the folks who are coming here who, you know, came over the border these are folks who literally are escaping something and usually the united states has been a refuge for so many of these people from all over the world i so you know it's disappointing i i am as you know a state senator not in the federal but um but i do you know pay of course some attention to that do venezuelans not vote republican enough uh, when they come here Is, is that the problem I, I, I'm only being half joking on that, by the way. I know. I, I will tell you that it would not surprise me if people that are escaping a socialist country do tend to vote in the other direction um, when they escape. But I really hope that that's not the reason. Yeah, I think I said that backwards. I meant do they not vote Democrat, Democrat. enough or, or, or something right, on that, right? right? Yeah. So, uh, and also, uh, finally, I uh, wanted to get your take on what's going on with the Jefferson County Commission and if you had any insight as to whether or not that situation was going to result in any kind of agreement to get back to business. I really, I can't even tell you. Um, so I don't have any extra insight. I have not spoken directly to the folks involved in it. But um, obviously, I hear about it mostly from constituents, and I don't know what to tell you. Um, I, I, my opinion is that we should be doing the people's business, and that means you show up to work and you make your votes, whether they're you know hard to make or not, um, and we just uh, move forward. I, I don't, I don't really understand. Um, um, what what the scenario is that is causing um, the reaction by some people. Senator Rucker, thanks so much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts on your end? No, thank you very much for having me on. Obviously, just so everyone knows, they can reach out to me if they have any concerns or questions. And regarding the um, detour of 340, literally, I am watching every single day those social media posts and staying on top of it. So don't think that we're you know, getting lazy. We're not. We're, we're still on top of it and watching it very closely. Somebody on Facebook asked if they were working around the clock or because of the nature of the work, do they need to make sure it's done during the daylight hours only? I, I believe that they must do it during the daylight hours. But, you know, I didn't ask that question. Okay. So I could ask. Be interesting to find that out. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Of course. You have a great day. You too.